D-U-M-B, everyone's accusing me. Hello and welcome to tonight's show. We're talking about the Ramones. We're drinking uh, cherry bubbly seltzer, of course. That's the best way to do it. And um, we got some beef. Beef! There's beef tonight. There's beef in Casa de la Ramones. Casa Ramones? Casa de Ramones? There's beef in the house of the Ramones. It's a crazy situation, in fact. T truly crazy. Because, well, where do we begin? <laughs> I suppose we begin with the fact that all the Ramones, except for Marky, Richie, and CJ, are, and technically Elvis, Elvis Ramon, Clem Burke, if you want to count him, they're all gone. They've all passed away. Uh, the core four, the original four, gone. Just completely gone. And two of those Ramones who have passed away were the, I guess the owners, remained the the owners uh, in the partnership of the band. Um, that's not to say that Barbara Ramone, who was uh, Dee Dee's late wife, and Marky and, you know, Tommy's estate don't have some sort of, you know, input or say. I don't know. I don't know how any of it works. But the controlling share, the, the, the shot callers, the shot callers are two estates because both Joey Ramone and Johnny Ramone have passed away. Joey passed away from lymphoma cancer in... Um, 2001 april of 2001 and johnny passed away of cancer in 2004 it's amazing how in very quick su succession um joey Dee Dee, and johnny all passed away and then tommy he passed away about 10 years later in 2014 i want to say he passed away but he i you know i don't i, I don't know what kind of involvement if any he had apart from being tommy ramon you know cj doesn't you know cj was came very late to the band and you know apart from being you know uh who he was in the band i mean he doesn't really have any say and marky who came in to replace tommy and then was i guess i i don't know what his how it worked back in the 70s through the 80s with him but i imagine that he had more of a say in the ramones then, or I don't know, maybe not. Maybe when he came back, when he came back after Richie bounced, maybe he did have more of a say in the Ramones. Maybe he did. Uh, a lot, a lot of speculation here. Um, not, not claiming to be an authority uh, on, on any which, on in any which way. Just trying to figure out out loud how it all works. The one thing I definitively know, though, is that because Joey and Johnny remained in the band together for all twenty-two years, unbroken in an unbroken chain. They retained the control and ownership and leadership position of the Ramones. And I got, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure Marky had a say in things in a variety of ways. I'm sure to a much lesser extent, maybe Dee Dee did. I don't know. I've read, so I've read everybody's books and Dee Dee's book in Dee Dee's book. It almost seems like he's, you know, Dee Dee gets paid by D yeah, right. Absolutely. Minister. You're right. Of course, Richie didn't definitely didn't have any say. In fact, that was part of the reason why Richie left. Richie was a hired gun who I think was making 500 bucks a show, which was not bad money in the 80s, but he wanted to be cut in on the T-shirt money. And he says that in End of the Century. And I can't blame him either. You know, at that point, he was contributing a lot to the band. He was, he turbocharged the band. They had just come back. They had, they had a lot of air underneath their wings with Too Tough to Die a very interesting period in Ramon's history. He had written, contributed several tracks. You know, I, I, he wanted, he wanted in on the t-shirt money. His name's on the t-shirt. He wanted some t-shirt money. I can't fault him for that. It's those kinds of deals. You know, the, these, uh, what's the word? Um, Equarian equal, uh, equality deals. I don't know what I'm trying to say. When you have an even split, when you have an even split amongst band members, there's less resentment. It, it, there's more harmony, but that also is not fair in the sense of 
Some people are creatively pulling their weight and others are not. I don't know. I don't know. That's that's a whole other separate side conversation that we could have forever about not just the Ramones, but any band. The point being is that Joey and Johnny were the shot callers. Joey and Johnny both passed away. Uh, Charlotte Lesher, I, I hope I'm not butchering her last name, who has also passed away. She was the mother of Joey Ramone and Mickey, Mickey Hyman, a.k.a. Mitchell Hyman, a.k.a. Mickey Lee. Uh, she eventually passed away, I think, in 2007. Now, her and, you know, Mickey, the brother, to a much lesser extent, I don't think Mickey had the keys. That was Charlotte was was the one driving the, the Joey car, I think, I believe. Um, but I think they worked, they must have worked, they worked in tandem, you know, as the, the, they are the Hyman family, you know, they they represent Joey's estate, you know, they did putting on the birthday bash and whatnot. And when she passed away, you know, the last, the last member of that, the last member of that family, living member of the family is Mickey. As far as I know, from what I know of, of him publicly, he doesn't have any children, right? He doesn't, he's not married and doesn't have any children. So he's, he's it, he is it. And when he's gone, that, that will be the end of that. But he has been the uh, arbiter of his brother's estate. And I think he's done a pretty good job of it too. I really do. I, I I think he's he's handled it very well, as as well as he could because there's 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 problems. There's problems. Um, now the flip side of, of that is the Johnny side, and Johnny, you know, none of the Ramones had children. None of them. Their their music was their children, right? Uh, he was married to Linda, Linda Cummings, Linda Ramone, and when Johnny passed away, she inherited his estate. So she represents the Johnny side and Joey is represented by now Mickey and Mickey and Linda have a very, um, a very, how to put it. I mean, you could say, you could say ad adversarial would be, would not be inappropriate to say it's, it's an adversarial relationship. And Mickey is pretty, you know, open about that. You know, there's not, he's, he's pretty open about it. He's been pretty open about it for a long time. Uh, in, in, in that regard. And now there's a lawsuit. Now, before we dive into what the lawsuit is, we need to actually turn the clock back. And this is not really for anybody who's familiar with the Ramones and the Ramones history knows, knows this already. This is not, this is not, <laughs> this is ancient information, but I feel like we, it must be said for the sake of the episode, for, for the sake of what we're doing here. The there is a, a a rift formed in the Ramones that started in the late seventies. The Ramones started in seventy four, and at some point in the late seventies, I don't know when it when that was. Maybe it was seventy eight, seventy nine. I don't know. At some point, the rift started to widen between Joey and Johnny. Um, Tommy, who was the you know manager and kind of you know he he kind of put you know, he was kind of the architect of the Ramones, right? That's how he's credited. And, you know, if you read all the books and stuff that it talks about how he, you know, kind of put everything together. Monty Melnick, who was also around, we did an interview with Monty is on, on this channel. Check that out. Um, Monty has a great book called on the R road with the Ramones. Go buy that on Amazon. And he talks about his POV. I mean, really, if you're not going to hear the story from the band itself, the two people that you would want to hear the, their POV because they were there would be Mickey Lee and, and Monty Melnick. I mean, they were there from the beginning, right? Pretty much. Um, so at some point, there's a rift between Joey and Johnny, and it does not make the band, you know, Tommy leaves. Dee Dee's the principal songwriter. Essentially, he's he's the one that's running. So it's very interesting. You always know when it's a DD song because it's about mental health, and you always know it's a room when it's a, a song about romance or girls or women. It's it's a it's a Joey song. That's not that's not rule of thumb per se, but you generally can tell who wrote what by that kind of decree a little bit. So um, so a riff started to form. Joey was dating Linda the same Linda, Linda Cummings, Joey was dating her first and they were together. And I believe I'm trying to remember what I, from whose memoir, what 
I think she did tour with the band when she was with Joey, but eventually she started to see Johnny behind Joey's back or, you know, you know, I don't know when, the, the, again, the chronology, like at some point they start hooking up behind Joey's back in some way, shape or form it starts. And, and she leaves Joey for Johnny. And that takes the rift in a whole different direction. The rift that began, you know, um, as characterized in all the Ramones books, you know, Johnny was a, you know, a, you know, allegedly, according to these Ramones books, Johnny, as it's printed, Johnny was a uh, racist, misogynistic, you know, asshole. <laughs> I mean, there's how else do you put it, right? Like, I mean, he was, he was, he was, uh, he could be a nasty guy in many ways. He was very right wing and Joey on the flip side, Joey suffered from, he had OCD, which made him difficult to, to work with in a variety of ways because of his OCD. And they didn't have a word for OCD at the time. So Joe, Joey was just, you know, quote unquote, would do weird stuff that nobody understood because there was nobody diagnosing Joey that he suffered from OCD. And Joey was also very left-leaning. So you had these two politically, ideologically separate people with very opposing views. And one of them stole the other guy's girlfriend, stole, quote unquote. She, she left him. She left him for, they, 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 they ran off together. Um, so much so that Joey wrote a song that is supposedly about this subject. Uh, the KKK took my baby away off of, it's either Pleasant Dreams or Subterranean. I think it's on Pleasant Dreams. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. It's on Pleasant Dreams. That's about Johnny Ramone taking Linda away, taking Linda away from him. The KKK took my baby away, my baby away, away from me. Um, yeah, I think that was... You no, know, pleasant dreams or subterranean jungle. Pleasant dreams. It is Matt. Pleasant dreams. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yep. It is uh pleasant dreams. Okay. Um, so and yet at the same time, somehow, you know, the Ramones really were, even though that nobody was biologically related, by taking the same name, they really they were so much more than just a band. They were a family. They were a family. They they had family squabbles and they, they, but they stuck together. They stayed together as a fam familial unit all the way through 1996. And you know, it's funny, 22 years is not that long for a band. You think about all the bands that have been around for 22 years yet for some reason, and maybe it's because they sort of were at the dawn of the beginning of like what eventually would become alternative music, like the Ramones from 74 to 96 like they were around for this i mean it's really not that long a period it's really really not um 74 to 96 and they 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 saw music change in so many ways in so many crazy ways from the dawn of punk through the the fall of nirvana a lot of musical history there and the ramones you know were like kind of like the rock and roll shark or, or crocodile, you know, the crocodile or the shark are these two animals, these two organisms that are, you know, have gone unchanged by evolution for, you know, millions of years. That's, the Ramones definitely changed for sure. I mean, especially you look at Joey's singing voice changed and evolved. I mean, that's not to say that things didn't change, but the point was, is that they remained the Ramones and this, that, and the other. Um, Yup says Mickey's, you know, we're going to talk about, I slept with Joey Ramone. I'm, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I will, uh, just for the sake, since we're talking about KKK took my baby away. Mickey's book says that the song was actually about another one of Joey's ex-girlfriends. And, you know, I have that book and I read that book when it came out and I think around 2011 and it's been a long time. I have not read it since. So there's a lot of details that I don't remember from the book. Um, I'm really glad that book came out because Joey never got to write a biography and, you know, Johnny got his biography. Uh, Marky got his, uh, Dee, Dee wrote a book, but Joe, uh, Joey never did. Joey never did. And, uh, that's a real shame. So the fact that, yeah, and I think the way that it was, it was worded, it, this is a punk rock family memoir. I think that was a really appropriate way to sort of 
you know, memorize, I know that's not a word to, to memorialize your, your, your brother who's not around at the same time. It does bother me that Joey is not there to speak in his own voice for some of the things that are mentioned in that book, you know, we, but at the same time, you know, we have to take his brother, his brother's word for it. His brother who is his, his keeper, his brother is literally his keeper because, because Joey's not around. So, so ideally I would want a book from Joey, but then, you know, in the, in the, in the fact that we can't have one, it's pretty awesome that Mickey at, with the help of, of legs, McNeil, I can think of no one better qualified to assist Mickey in his endeavor of writing the book. It's a great book. Everybody should go read it 100% because Mickey, Mickey was there from the beginning. He was a roadie. He was an underpaid roadie. Uh, he did a lot of stuff for the Ramones. And in fact, I'm sure it's mentioned in the book. Yup. Tell me if you, if you remember this, does anybody know what songs Mickey wrote for the Ramones or contributed? I remember it in the book, he contributed to Ramon songs and I'm not talking about the hand claps on Blitzkrieg Bop. I'm talking about like actual songwriting credits. I know I'm think, pretty sure he played some leads as well. You know, he, anytime they asked him for something musically, because you know, even though Joey was a songwriter and a musician in his own right, his brother Mickey was, you know, also incredibly talented on the guitar, man, and and uh, a singer and, and this, that, and the other. But Yup says that it was nine nine to five world. Yes, I know he sang on Blitzkrieg Bop, but, you know, and that there was a lot of controversy, Ravner, about that as well. And this is, that's really, so my biggest problem with the book, in all honesty, I respect that Mickey wanted to say his piece, but the, what upsets me too, is that like Joey can't, Joey can't like give his POV, you know, because he died. So it's like, we don't know Joey's feelings on that from firsthand account. We only know what Mickey has to say about it. <clears throat> and he tries very, he makes a concerted effort to really show you things from his perspective as to, you know, Hey, I've worked for the Ramones. I've done so much for them endlessly. And now they come into a little money. Can't, you know, why don't they break me off a piece? You know, he contributed lyrics to Susie as a headbanger. If, if I was Joey Ramone and I got 25 K for Blitzkrieg Bop, I definitely would have broken off my brother. some a piece if he had done all that stuff for me. But at the end of the day, it's kind of like, uh, you know, it, it comes down to a fine line of like entitled, like what, what is this person entitlement versus, you know, willingness to, to, to give away, to bequeath, you know, like there's like a scale there. And I think maybe, um, I don't know. I think maybe Mickey's entitlement was a little out of whack in, in a sense, but, you know, he justified it with the idea that, like, look at all the shit I did for the Ramones. Like, look at all the stuff I did. He was, you know, a, a, a ba great bands are supported by, you know, irreplaceable people. And that's who Mickey was. Mickey Lee was, you know, to the Ramones. So it's uh, you could I could see the I see the 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 perspective from both sides. How about that? Um. So, you know, there's a, just a, there's a deep, there was always a deep riff. Now the flip, now one other thing I want to say about this before we move on to what the current situation is, one more thing there is to say, and that is that through it all, through it all, okay, Ravner says legally, he should be entitled to something for his contributions to the song, especially if they were committed to tape. That's like, you know, that's a weird thing. Yes. I, and I think he talks about that in the book too, but royalties and you know maybe it's like semantical like the semantics in the categories at the end of the day if you contribute he contributed hand claps you know uh, as opposed to being like a, does that count as being a session musician like culturally when you when you appear on someone's record if someone comes in and asks you to do gang vocals and that record blows up you know are you should you be expecting royalties from from said person i don't know I, I i don't know i don't like a part of me kind of feels like that's a little weird like should the band like you know break off a piece yeah i mean don't there's no reason to be a greedy dick but at the same time it's like 
they've got to want to do it. Like it can't just be like, oh no, you owe this to me. So I, I don't know. I, I don't really know. He had he had yeah right sibling rivalry with Joey, but I've but I have but I've heard any recordings. Um, the, I've 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 heard that they did an EP. I think there's three songs. They're okay. Not nothing nothing to write home about. Um, Mickey has Mickey's had a series of bands. He had a band with Lester Bangs called Birdland. I think it was Birdland, right? And he also had Mickey Lee's Stop. He had the the Rattlers. That was the big one. That was his big. That's when 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 I think the Rattlers was when he was really just trying to break through on his own. You know, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to associate myself with the Ramon thing. I'm going to call myself Mickey Lee. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to do it. Um, and then now, as of recently, he has Mickey Lee's Mutated Music, which is great stuff. Go check it out if you haven't heard Mickey Lee's Mutated Music. Um, on the flip side, and and then, you know, the other thing too is Mickey, Mickey has put out, I think there was some controversy. Mickey put out a posthumous release it's uh, of demos and called it a second album called you know which is something that which is a colloquialism that um i guess people from queens say particularly i don't know if it's a new york city thing or if it's a queens thing but it's this y a no like you know you know at the end of a sentence it's done in a certain way and um and I, there was some controversy about it because some people were like, it's not really a, a solo album because Joey was Joey was actively working on a single solo album, which came out, Don't Worry About Me, which came out and then Joey passed away. And so this was kind of like taking, you know, a bunch of material and scraps and this, that, and the other. And I think Mickey might have even co-written some stuff and he tried to really, uh, it was marketed as a lost second album and maybe maybe joey intended a second album. he was really sick at the end though right like you know and, and that's the other shame too about the brothers is that like they had had a falling out and they sort of they they like patched it up at the end when when he died when 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 joey died but um there was there was a there was some lost time from my, at least from what i remember reading there was some lost time something like that um very sad very sad situation um, yes, we, yes, Joey and Marky did have beef and someday we are going to take a look at the legendary Howard Stern tape. That is just so amazing. Um, I know that recently in 2022, Mickey, Mickey actually sold off the, the, the estate through the estate. He sold off the interest um, the music publishing, uh, Joey's music publishing for $10 million. Now, look, at the end of the day, again, as far as I know, and maybe I'm wrong, as far as I know, L Mickey's the last relative, right? He's the last last of them. Um, apart, apart, maybe there's cousins or something. Um, but he is, you know, there's nobody else to carry on the estate once Mickey is gone. Essentially, really sad to say that out loud. So this is a situation selling the, the publishing for $10 million makes a lot of sense because he is ensuring that his brother's affairs will be maintained and represented after he is gone, which is the right thing to do. And Mickey has gotten a... <laughs> A very nice payday. Uh, how much of that ten million does he, you know, retain versus what? I mean, it's nobody's business, but I'm sure Mickey's doing okay for himself. Um, yeah, that's true. That is true. Joey was sick the last couple of years in the Rones, and I believe he had been recording that solo album for quite a while. So the idea that you know was this like this secret second album. It doesn't. I, yeah, I don't know. On the flip side of all this, uh, Linda Ramone has, you know, she's been, she's very vocal and very, you know, uh, sort of, I don't know. She, she has done her best to represent her husband's, uh, musical interests, uh, posthumously. And, um, you know, they got to come together. I think they have a corporation and I would imagine that Barbara Ramone, Dee Dee's late wife, uh, that they all have some kind of voting power and that those two have senior voting power 
in a 50 50 split. Do not quote me on that. I do not know that for a fact. That's just what I, um, I, I think. I think that's what the situation is. Um, now, Mickey has also had trouble with Linda. Linda has sent all sorts of things to Mickey, including, quote, unquote, uh, Mickey posted this on his Facebook page um, a, a while back. Let me see if I can share this real quick. This is the type of stuff that that the type of conflict that was being dealt with. Here you go. So this is the type of stuff that Mickey was dealing with. Mitchell also continues to post other Ramones IP without Linda's consent on his social media pages, including videos covering Ramones songs, which are being used solely to promote Mitchell's own musical career. And then he, Mickey says, I'm sorry. I didn't mean he's very, he could be very, he has a good, he has a really good sense of humor. Mickey. He says, um, he says, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to have my song come out on a Ramones bootleg. Honest. So this is, it says Ramones unreleased tracks on YouTube lost. So this is a, this is a Mickey Lee song that was co-opted by some Ramones fan and put it out as, as Ramones music. And that's gotta be frustrating in and of itself, let alone for, let alone for Linda to, to come out, to come after him and 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 give him give him business this is where i got the 50 percent partner thing by the way uh admonished again today by 50 percent partner quote unquote mitchell continues to post ramones ip without linda's consent including videos of him covering ramone songs which are being used solely to wrote mitchell's own musical career so tell me whose career whose career is this promoting and it says ramones don't be so strange unreleased track and i believe this too is a um mickey lee track let me see if it says something here i should have checked this before i um bum, 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 sorry so it was 50 percent partner specifically citing these youtube videos where other people have uploaded your music as ramon songs i certainly don't remember you posting any ramon songs to promote yourself i've never seen this is this is for certain Mickey has done a great job. Listen, for all the, the, the sort of criticisms I gave, Mickey has done a great job of being an arbiter of his brother's estate. As I said, he insur he's ensured that the publishing is taken care of. So when, that, when Mickey passes, that Joey Ramone is well represented and will be, continue to be represented in, in, uh, in, in history, in, in Ramone's history and whatnot. Um, but I've never seen I've never seen Mickey use Ramones music to promote himself. I have not. I can't say it. Um, Mickey says, no, they don't seem to be something she wants to bring attention to. Someone might hear them and get the impression that I'm not nothing but a no talented, no but nobody bitter, jealous, wannabe coattail writer. I do have a reputation to uphold, though. So, you know, Mickey takes it in good, good stride. But the point is, is that people take Mickey's songs and label them as Ramon songs. And, and then she gets, and then Linda gets pissed about it, you know? Um, so it's a whole thing. Now, before we go on, let's move on to, to the big business here. But before we do, I want to tell you about the new deal we have at Riot Stickers. And you know what? I'm going to let Jeff pre-recorded Jeff do it. So pre-recorded Jeff, Take take the take the reins here, and when we return, we will take a look at what's going on currently. Ooh, ah, ooh, ah. We've got a new sticker deal at Riot Stickers. That's right, folks. We are starting a brand new promotion here at RiotStickers.com, and it is for die cut stickers. <gasps> What exactly is die cut? What does it mean? It's time for Sticker Science 101. Basically, you got your regular stickers, right? But we introduce a new element with the die cut sticker. Basically, what you do with a computer-guided scalpel. That's right, computer-guided scalpels. Isn't that a great band name, computer-guided scalpel? I love it. You can cut the exact shape of whatever your design is. So whatever you got going on, whatever its borders are, there's no borders, there's no limitations. You take your computer guided scalpel and you just cut around the edge and you get, voila, a die cut sticker. So in addition 
to the UV coating that protects from the sun. In addition to being printed on vinyl, which makes them weatherproof and waterproof, you can now have the exact shape that you want. Well, you always could, but you couldn't for a price like this. For $69, you can get 200 die-cut stickers. There are some people out there who are die-cut fanatics. They need die-cut stickers in their lives. You are not going to find a better deal than this. Now, there's only one place you're going to find this incredible die-cut sticker deal for $69. 200 stickers for $69. And that's if you go to the link down in the description. You go to riotstickers.com backslash from us. That's riotstickers.com backslash from us. What, Sharpie Riot, have you lost your mind? Have you lost your mind? These prices are insane. These prices are Crazy Eddie level prices. If you know Crazy Eddie, then you might be old. You might be older than me. You're probably way older than me. You click on the link, you do the thing, and you get your die cut stickers. Do not hesitate to get this deal, okay? And without further ado, future Jeff, roll the 60-second Riot sticker commercial. Go, do it. And that's a promise. Okay, let's take a look. Let us take a look now at the thing. Okay, here we go. This is from Billboard Magazine. It's by Bill Donahue, and it came out on the 25th. Okay. Um, hey, ho, let's go to court. Ramones heirs locked in legal battle over Pete Davidson's Joey Ramone movie. So Pete Davidson, yeah, that guy, you know who I'm talking about. Um, Pete Davidson, uh, the guy from SNL, and he's from Staten Island, and uh, this, that, and the other. He's playing Joey Ramone, and he's been working with Mickey Lee, and they've been putting together a um, an adaptation of, of the book, I Slept with Joey Ramone. Uh, turning it into a movie and whatnot. And um, it's supposed to come out on Netflix. And I believe that I believe that the movie is written by Pete. And I believe Pete is starring. It's kind of like a, a, a vehicle for Pete Davidson. And um, and it's being, well, there, there, there's problems. A long simmering feud between the families of Joey and Johnny Ramone has erupted into a new lawsuit over a proposed biopic about one of them. And this comes in now. Now, this is where things get really interesting, folks. Uh, there's a new front in the long legal war between the family members of the late of late Ramon founders, Joey and Johnny Ramon, this time over a planned Netflix movie starring Pete Davidson centered on the pioneering punk band. Now, I'm not familiar with what the what the long the long legal war between the family members. I, I, what else has happened? I mean, maybe there's more stuff and I'm just not aware of it in a lawsuit filed Saturday uh, in Manhattan court. That was Saturday, January 21st. Johnny's widow, Linda Ramone claims that Joey's brother, Mickey Lee, Mitchell Hyman covertly developed an unapproved and unauthorized Ramones based biopic based on his own one-sided recitation of history of the Ramones though. And I think so I can already tell that like, maybe if it was done, maybe if it was an adaptation of somebody else's book, because it's, I slept with Joey Ramone, which is Mickey Lee's memoir about his own brother that probably plays into her passion for wanting to put an injunction on this thing or whatever she's doing. Um, 
though the lawsuit doesn't identify Netflix by name, it says that the disputed movie will be based on Lee's memoir, I Slept with Joey Ramone. Netflix's planned movie announced in 2021 has the same name, is based on the same book, and is being developed with the support of the estate of Joey Ramone. Since Linda and Lee split ownership, so here you go. That's what we were wondering earlier, and now we know definitively. Marky doesn't have a say. CJ obviously doesn't have a say. Richie most certainly doesn't have a say. And I guess Tommy and Dee Dee's estates don't have a say. Since Linda and Lee split ownership of the intellectual property for the band, widely regarded as pioneers of punk rock and one of the most influential rock bands of all time, absolutely true, Linda says a movie that will focus heavily on the Ramones as a group cannot go forward without her say-so. So it sounds also like Linda's in a power play, and many things have been said about Linda Ramone over the years. She is beloved by many and, you know, um, uh, not so much by others, you know, the she's a... Some she is she is a somewhat controversial figure within within the Ramones. Um, but she does, she is the you know, she heads up the estate and she it, she has the say so. And it makes you wonder who the hell is gonna take over for her when she passes away because she doesn't have any kids, they don't have any kids. Um, Miss Ramone objects to defendants' attempt to create a Ramones film without her involvement. Not to be abstinent, but rather based on defendants' disregard for Ramon's assets and their conduct and treatment of Miss Ramon and her late husband, Linda's attorney's right, to permit defendants alone to tell the authoritative story. So there, I, I don't, has it been, has it been advertised as the authoritative definitive story? I think it's just a, it's just a biopic told from that perspective. There's nothing wrong with that inherently apart from the fact that Linda doesn't have anything in development and I'm sure she could get something in development. And so therefore she wants to have a say in what's going on here. Um, she says that to permit defendants alone to tell the authoritative story of the Ramones would be an injustice to the band and its legacy. Now, one thing I think is for certain, I didn't know Joey Ramone. And I didn't know Johnny Ramone. I've read a lot about them. I've read a lot of interviews with them and you know, whatever I've, I've immersed myself in all things Ramones and I want to imagine, this is, I want to imagine that if both of those guys were still alive today and they were on relatively even ground with each other, that they would work together in tandem to create a Ramones biopic. Like uh, Johnny would certainly not be down with what's going on right now. And I, but I, at the same time, I don't think that Joey would try to do this without Johnny. Right, Joey wouldn't be trying to do a, a Ramones biopic without him. They would work together to do it. So, um, I so to an extent that that this is only happening because they're not around anymore. It's it's I mean it's kind of the truth. Um, th does that mean that Mickey shouldn't be allowed to adapt his book into a film? No, I he absolutely has every right to do that. Of course he does. Now, does he run into issue? Is does he run into de depicting Johnny becomes a problem because the, you know Linda has the rights to Johnny Johnny's image, so that does become I think that does become problematic and on some some level. But um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, through the uh, though the planned movie is one major point of dispute, Linda's lawsuit also includes a raft of other allegations. Okay, so I guess there's there's way more going on, and maybe that's what Mickey was sharing about on Facebook. You know, the uh, with in regards to posting the posting of his songs as Ramon songs. Uh, Linda's lawsuit also includes a raft of other allegations against Lee and David Frey, a director of the Ramones holding company. So the Ramones holding company is probably, that's the business entity that, that Lee and, and Linda both feed into right on something like that. Um, 
a director of the Ramones, David Frey, a director of the Ramones holding company appointed to his role by Lee. So Lee was the one who appointed David Frey. And I guess Linda had nothing to do with it. She says the pair have effectively shut down the entire company unfairly withheld payments to her and otherwise thrown the company's operations into chaos. It is apparent. Now, look, is that entirely true? I mean, that is a totally biased one-sided view of what's happening do do and do i think that mickey lee would do such things i don't i don't think so i really don't i have no there's no grounds for for me to think that i just don't think it i don't know just from you know i don't know it just doesn't seem likely to me is it apparent from defendants? Cont I'm just saying I, I haven't seen any, I haven't looked into it too deeply, but I haven't seen any proof to, to, to definitively agree with Linda Ramone on that. Uh, it is apparent from the defendant's continuing course of conduct that their main objective is to torment Miss Ramone until she agrees to sell her interests. Okay. So she thinks that they're putting the, arm, the, the muscle on her to sell her interests. And I don't think, I mean, is it possible that that could be happening? No, who knows? You know, we just got done saying that Mickey and her butt heads all the time. Mickey probably wants her gone and she wants him gone. So I don't know. Maybe, maybe I got this all wrong. Regrettably, defendants appear willing to allow the band's legacy to decay in order to benefit their own self-interest. Uh, they weren't friendly. Uh, Joey, who served as the band's leader from their founding in 1974, died of cancer in 2001. We already know this. We went over this already. The two punk rockers who were not actually related had notoriously unbrotherly relationship. I wouldn't say that at all, man. They didn't have an unbrotherly relationship. They had a very brotherly relationship. That was the problem was that they had a brotherly relationship. A rift rooted partly in their different differing personalities and political views, but also the fact that Linda dated Joey before eventually marrying Johnny. I mean, that is a great story. You know, these people are no longer around anymore and their history becomes the stuff of mythology and legend. And that is a story that maybe would, would, would be an interesting one to tell from a musical biopics perspective. The two nonetheless formed a lucrative business partnership that they did toured heavily for decades until the band finally broke up for good in 1996. And you know what? Despite all the uh, dismay that they had between them, they held it together. They were a united front in the band, you know, mostly, and they, they did their thing. But in a 2016 interview with the New York Post, Lee put it bluntly, they weren't friendly. In the And, you know, listen, I've had Mickey, who was on the road with them way longer than Mickey, Sorry, did I say Mickey? I meant Monty. I had Monty on my show who, who was with the Ramones every waking moment. And he personally told me that that's BS, man, that of course those guys talked. And of course, you know, because the, the atmosphere was always uh, so much so that they, they wouldn't talk to each other where they would use an intermediary to speak through each other when they were, when they could hear each other in the, in the van. Right. Um, but, you know, of course, yes, they weren't friendly, but they they held together. You know, uh, Johnny has been quoted as saying, I never could have continued without Joey. He was my lead singer, you know, that sort of thing. And um, I've also heard rumors, stories, tales, lies, exaggerations that Johnny wanted to call Joey at the end and just didn't. It didn't happen, but that he had a desire to do something that he was very dismayed, very upset when his partner died. In the years since the two bandmates passed away, the feud seemed to continue between Lee and Linda. As the executors of Johnny and Joey's respective estates, Linda and Lee each own half of Ramones Productions, Inc., an entity that has been described in court filings as the vehicle through which the iconic punk rock musical group markets, merchandises, licenses, and produces its memorabilia and music-related projects. In 2018, Lee filed a legal action. Okay, so here is where the, the legal stuff comes in that I was not aware of. Lee filed a legal action against Linda via private ar arbitration, alleging that she was improperly using the band's intellectual property and unfairly associating herself with the Ramones name with projects like a Ramones Ranch in Los Angeles, violating the agreement that governs how Ramones Productions is run. 
that now informs why Linda would try and, you know, give shit to Mickey over people using co-opting Mickey's songs and, and labeling them as Ramon songs. Again, something that I don't think Mickey would have ever done, especially after reading his book. Uh, in a decision that was later made public in court, an arbitrator partially sided with Lee, restricting how Linda could use the Ramon's name and even required her to go by Linda Cummings Ramon in certain situations. But the arbitrator roundly criticized both sides for their ongoing feuding, reminding them that they had an almost sacred mission to be the caretakers for the band's creative work. Hell fucking yeah. I mean, listen, they both want for nothing financially because of the Ramones, they should work together to make sure the Ramones is well taken care of because there's no one else around to do it. And again, I am very happy that Mickey has done what he has done. And I'm glad that Mickey is making a movie. I can't wait to watch it. I want to see it, you know, uh, no matter what I want to see it, but you know, I don't know who knows. Instead, the parties have allowed their personal egos and their animus for one another to interfere with their joint obligations by failing to communicate. Uh, uh, I can't say that word. Uh, uh, how can I pronounce that word? I suck. Obfuscating. I've said that word and I know what that word is, but I can't literally cannot physically pronounce it. Obfuscating, 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 obfuscating information and unreasonably withholding their approvals, the arbitrator wrote in May of 2019. The admonishment did little good. Last year, the pair headed back to litigation, this time after Linda initiated arbitration proceedings that aimed to remove some someone from the board of directors of Ramones Productions. Lee filed a court case to halt the arbitration, arguing that it was an improper use of that process. The case remain, remains pending. So they're spending who knows how much money fighting each other when they could be united. It's kind of a bummer, a universal story of family. Uh, the latest legal scuffle appears to have been triggered in part by plans for a movie version of I slept with Joey Ramone Lee's uh, tw 2009. Oh, that's when I read it. It was 2009. Whenever it came out is when I read it. I thought it was 2011 Lee's 2000. No, no wonder I don't remember it. It was 2009 when I read that book. Lee's 2009 mem memoir bull uh, build as an enduring portrait of a man who struggled to find his voice and of the brother who loved him. Netflix announced the film in April, 2021, uh, the 20th anniversary of Joey's death. In fact, with Davidson set to co-write and stars Joey. So he's a co-writer and Jason Orley, big time adolescence. And I want you back signed on to direct. I slept with Joey Ramone is a great rock anthem that will make an equally great rock biopic set apart for, by a universal story of family. Adam Fogelson, chairman of the company spearheading the film, said in Netflix's press release announcing the project. Netflix said that the movie, which remains in early stage development in 2024, would be produced with the cooperation and support of the estate of Joey Ramone. But in her new lawsuit, Linda says that such a project needs the sign up of Ram sign off of Ramon's productions, not just Joey's estate. Now, remember how I said Mickey should 100% be allowed to make this movie. I, I stand by what I said, but there is a good point here by Linda. It does need the sign off from Ramon's productions. This is not a Joey Ramon biopic. It's going to have to involve the other Ramones. You're going to need a sign off from Ramones Productions. Now, should Linda sign off on it? Yes, of course she should. Um, she should sign off on it and she should say, Mickey, I would like to have a little input here, you know, in, in some way, shape, or form to make sure that my, my husband is represented how I want him to be represented. I don't think that's an unreasonable request. No matter what I think of Linda Ramone, that's not an unreasonable request on her part. But these, they just, they do not like each other. As 50% shareholder of Ramones Productions, Inc., Miss Ramone would never have consented to the defendant's unilateral development of a Ramones biopic, her lawyers wrote, nor would she then or at any point in the future agree to permit the inclusion of any RPI intellectual property or recordings in such a film project. Because that's the thing, you're going to need Ramones music in a Ramones movie, but how are you going to do that if 
Linda's not going to sign off on the music. You're going to have to re-record the music. That's what would have to happen. According to Linda's attorneys, Lee and Frey have told others that they plan to circumvent any objection she has to the movie, including by potentially re-recording Ramon's songs that could be used in the film. There you go. And once they do so, she says they will unfairly get to tell the authoritative story of the iconic band. There will likely not be an appetite for a subsequent Ramones film. That's not true. Pete, that's so not true. If you think about the fact, think about how many books there are about the Ramones. Think about how many books there are about the Beatles that people always want more. Of course you could do another Ramones movie. There will likely not be an, uh, an appetite for a subsequent Ramones film, thus destroying the single most lucrative and substantial uh, cooperate opportunity of the company and usurping it as the defendant's own. Linda wrote, I disagree there. I dis I, that I disagree with. Netflix is not named in the lawsuit and is not accused of any wrongdoing. The company not request, uh, did not return a request for comment on the new lawsuit. Life rights or free speech rights. That that's an interesting one. Legally speaking, whether a movie producer would need one band member to sign off on a movie about one of his famous bandmates is a tricky question. Would John Lennon's estate need to sign off on a Paul McCartney movie? I think so. I think so. You can't. You, uh, you have to. I mean, that, that would have to happen. How you doing, Angus? Welcome to tonight's broadcast. Um, you would have to, man. Could Dave Grohl stop a Kurt Cobain biopic? Good point. While many risk-adverse filmmakers and studios secure life rights before they make such movies, essentially a guarantee that the production will not be hamstrung by litigation over likeness rights or defamation allegations. They're not strictly necessary. The First Amendment largely protects the right to make movies based on real historical figures, whether they want their story told or not. That's a good point, too. That's also a good point. So it's this weird thing. It's a weird thing. It's like freedom of speech. You're a historical figure and you're dead. And, you know, you sh like it's the same thing. Isn't that that's what it's fair use in documentary as well. You know what I mean? Like if somebody wants to tell do a documentary about you can't stop them you can't if you're a public figure you can't um life rights are an, now one thing that here's the tricky part there's also the right to publicity and that is where someone's likeness they're they're they have the right to their likeness and the right to their own publicity and if you infringe on that then that could affect them, their ability to make money off their own image and they can go after you in court. So it's a, it's a mess. It's a friggin' mess. Um, Pete Davidson is a horrible choice for Joey Ramone. So that will definitely be, there will definitely be an appetite for another film. Listen, I, I, I can see it, man. I could see him doing it. I could see it working out. I, I'm, I think he, I think he has what it takes to play Joey Ramone. I don't know why. I don't know what it is about Pete Davidson, I mean, besides his physical appearance, but I just have a feeling he's going to be able to pull it off. And I, I, I'm curious. I'm willing to buy the ticket to take the ride and see it. I want to see it go down. Is it going to be good? I don't know. You know what I just realized I'm missing? And I was like, why does this feel so plain? I'm missing my, uh, my border. That's why this is like, I'm like, what is up with my, I couldn't figure it out. I was like, what is going on with my, uh, I didn't have my border this whole time. That is so that is so strange. I didn't have my button either. My button. You gotta get that up. Where do I put it? It's the link tree, but from now on, do not go to the link tree. Go to my website, from us.com. It's all about from us.com. That's what we want. We don't want to go to I just redid my website. I'm still working on it. And uh Everybody should go to fromus.com, go to fromus.com, give it a visit, see what's going on there. Check out all my stuff. Lots of stuff, stuff is there. I think a lot of this animosity got worse when Arturo died. Arturo was a bit of an arbitrator for the band. That's true. He was running the official Ramones website and they all received money from the merchandise. Yeah, he kind of was, he was kind of like a solvent Wow, Rennie thinks that Pete could play a 90s DD. I don't think so, man. I think Pete is good, man. I think Pete is good. I think he's going to work out. We'll see. We'll see. But I think he's going to work out. 
Uh, so yeah, so life rights, life rights are an agreement for access and a promise not to sue, but there's no intellectual property attached to our life story itself, says Linda Califf, an attorney at the firm Donaldson Califf Perez, who specializes in rights clearance for films and TV. We all have a First Amendment right to tell a story. A story about a band is just comprised of facts, even if there are really interesting facts. I mean, it's a good point, man. But in practical terms, a movie about a famous band raises a unique problem. It effectively needs to use the band's copyrighted music. That's the biggest issue, really. And they'd have to re-record the songs, it sounds like. Uh, can you imagine Walk the Line without hearing Johnny Cash songs or Straight Outta Compton without any NWA tracks? In the context of a musical biopic, uh, that gives someone like Linda with her veto power over the band's music more leverage to demand involvement. That's the problem. It gets stickier with the rights to music, Cal said. Even if you could tell the story, you're not going to be able to license it in the music. But we just said, we just heard that they can cir they'll circumvent that by re-recording stuff. Uh, the other layer to the current dispute is contractual. Linda's lawsuit points to a legal settlement from a 2009 to which she both to, to with to which both she and Lee allegedly agreed that any separate or individual projects involving Ramon's intellectual property re require the prior written approval of the company and its owners. Okay, so there that's where Mickey runs into the that's that's the that's where Mickey hits the wall. So if that is true and if that is the, the case then Mickey is is in the wrong because he made that agreement. Even if a studio has the right to tell any historical story it wants, a party to a contract could be barred from signing uh, certain de uh, deals, uh, intransigence and harmful actions beyond the dispute over. I don't know if I said that word right. Intrans intransigence, intransigence. Let's let's look that up. Actually, I don't know what that means. Um, it means refusal to change one's views or agree to something. Fair enough. Uh, beyond the dispute over the film, Linda's new lawsuit includes a slew of other accusations about Lee echoing the strongly worded tone of their previous legal battles. Lee, Linda says that Lee and Frey have refused to engage with Ramon's record label, its social media creative agency, its merchandising partners, or its long-term business managers, that they regularly create uh, inter, intercine disputes and unnecessary work that drains the company of funds that they have prevented the company from conducting basic operational tasks and have baselessly and in bad faith withheld dividend payments from her, effectively holding Miss Ramon's money hostage unless she agrees with their initiatives. After exhausting every resource at her disposal to try and right the ship, Linda Ramon reluctantly brings this action as the last resort. Linda's lawyer writes, now we've heard everything from Linda's side because Linda is the pov here but i want to hear mickey's pov on this as well and i don't know if we will i don't know if the defendant will will uh yeah the cbgb movie was bad i'm not gonna lie that that was that was really bad and thank you i'm glad you love the channel if you guys like this channel please leave me a skull i want all of your skulls leave me a skull make sure to subscribe to the channel and make sure to leave a comment that and and like the video that helps with the algorithm please go and like the video right now if you're watching this and you're enjoying the content like this video to push it up um simply put rpi as it current as it is currently constituted is not working due to the in tran <laughs> transit and transigence and harmful actions undertaken by Frey and Lee. Ultimately, Linda claims that the only possible solution to years long dispute is to remove Frey from the company and appoint a court ordered receiver to take charge of it. Mr. Frey's continued involvement and ob ob obfuscation, there it is, obfuscation, that's how you say it, remains a significant hurdle towards resolving even the most straightforward of operational issues. In technical terms, the lawsuit accuses Frey and Lee of breaching their fiduciary duty to the company and of unjust enrichment. It demands that the court order phrase removal as director of the company and request the appointment of a receiver. An attorney for Lee declined to comment on the lawyer's lawsuits allegations. An attorney for Frey did not immediately return requests for comment. Ramones fans want a Ramones movie. That is true. I am a Ramones fan. I definitely want a Ramones movie. 
in it, uh, in some ways, the current dispute over the Joey biopic was predicated by the 2019 arbitration ruling, which detailed the long struggle between Linda and Lee. In it, the arbitrator went to great lengths to plead with Linda and Lee to put aside their differences. We already heard this part. He warned them against their time-consuming and costly legal battles that caused the Ramones brand to experience tepid growth. That is true. Mickey Hyman and Linda Cummings Ramone have been entrusted with the exceedingly important mission of preserving the legacy of the Ramones for its existing followers and to grow its iconic brand to a new worldwide, worldwide group of music fans. The arbitrator wrote at the time, the only way those goals can be accomplished, in my estimation, is for there to be some radical changes made by Mickey, Linda, and the representatives. If those changes could be made, the arbitrator identified one key area for future growth, a movie. He said, and it's, listen, it's been, look, it's been 20 years, right? It's been about 20 years now since, since Johnny has died. So the, the core, the three core of the band, Joey, Johnny, and Dee, Dee they've all been dead for over 20 years. It's time for a Ramones movie. In my estimation, uh, if those changes could be made, the arbitrator identified one key area for future growth of the movie. He cited the then recent success of the movie Bohemian Rhapsody, which he said had boosted Queen to its highest chart position in 38 years and demonstrates the power that a biopic can have on improving the stature of a rock band. That movie eventually earned more than $900 million. $900 million. In my estimation, Ramones fans want a Ramones movie, the arbitrator wrote at the time. To make that happen, each side would need to put uh, put on hold their individual desires to make a Mickey movie or a Linda movie and join together to authorize a great biopic to be made about its historically important band. You know what? Out of everything that I said that I agree with, I have to say this: this is my this is the Jerry Springer final thought right here. In my estimation, Ramones fans want a Ramone movie. To make that happen, each side will need to put on hold their individual desires to make a Mickey movie or a Linda movie and join together to authorize a great biopic to be made about the about this historically important band. I man, that's that's where that's the ultimate answer here. Okay. What do you guys think? Well, let, let me leave the, the question with you. We're at the end of the, the show here. What do you all think? What do you think? Do you think that that's ultimately the answer or does Mickey need to just push on? Does Linda need to stop this? You know, um, it is a shame that like, think for a second, like think about like what, what must be in the vaults too. Like there's gotta be a lot of stuff in the vaults and like, it's just probably languishing there. You know, I mean, we've gotten some stuff, but like they did those really great remastered extended releases in the 2000s. Who remembers those? They had demos and bonus tracks. They were great, really, really great packages. And I feel like that was the last great thing to come out of the Ramones camp. Like really, truly, you know, Linda was trying to do like a Johnny Ramone army thing. And uh, there was a Didi Ramone army thing for a while and nothing really ever. I mean, Mickey did the book, right? And, you know, and he did the, the Joey solo album. I guess it's been hard. I guess it really, when I think about it, when I think about the last 20 years, there just really hasn't been too much stuff because they can't, they don't unite on things. That's the problem. Angus says, I would like a Ramones movie if it's good. What a shame with all this stickiness has evolved in such a great band. I mean, I get it, but Lori Lord. Yeah, man. Ain't that the truth? Um, that's all we got for you tonight. Hope you enjoyed the show. Thank you. Peace. Hair grease. Keep your eyes peeled for the Manny Martinez show. I was also just on the phone with Franche Coma. Everybody knows Franche Coma from Misfits. He's coming on the show. It's finally happening. He was on my show. He's in the Manny tribute thing along with Mr. Jim and Robbie Bloodshed, but he's going to come on for his own solo show to make it up to everybody. We're going to make up what we what we were unable to do that first time. It's going to be spectacular. Lots more stuff coming. A lot of stuff coming. Keep your eyes peeled, YouTube members and and uh, um, uh, uh, Patreons. We got more John Christ. We got more, more, and more, and more, and more, and more. It's never ending. My documentary is coming out. Kuyashi Gonzo, Blood Visions and Chaos Magic. Um, the most Gonzo thing I've ever done. And, you know, if you don't like Netflix, 
If you don't like Netflix, if you prefer to watch YouTube, I got two hours of of uh, of a of the crazy of a crazy story about trying to make art, waiting for your eyeballs. And of course, eventually, Gouge Away and Romeo's Distress will be out on Blu-ray. That's going to be awesome, and even more to come after that. Okay, enough. Peace, hair grease. We'll see you next time. Like, subscribe. Check out the Patreon, YouTube memberships.